Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. All right, everybody. So our final uh, act of the day is one that uh, is our closing speaker for, uh, for Friday. We'll have three keynote speakers throughout the weekend. Uh, J.J. Schlesinger will be here tomorrow night to close things out on Saturday. And on, uh, on Sunday, we've got Brian Tan, who I mentioned earlier is a, a former jail guard from the Keene Spiritual Retreat here in town. Um, I wanted to have Carla uh, up here to talk to us, uh, Carla Garrick. I'm sure you've all heard her speak before, especially if you were here earlier today for the ladies' panel. She is a, a persuasive speaker. She's friendly. She's bubbly, effusive. She uh, always has something fun uh, to say. She's always got a smile on her face. And that's the kind of thing that I like to, uh, to put out there. So um, she's also, in case you don't know, the president of the Free State Project. And of course, the Free State Project is the reason why we're all in this room here together uh, today. Now, she hasn't been the president of the Free State Project forever, but it's been, what, two years? Two years. And now she's actually on board as, uh, as paid staff of the Free State Project to help get us from 75% at 15,000, which, by the way, this is really the first official, official gathering. <laughs> Without further ado, Carla Garrick, the president of the Free State Project. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm glad I told him don't steal my speech, because he will say everything, and he'll say it better than I can. I just uh, wanted to make a comment to, to the civil disobedience panel. You know, one... Actually, the reason I am in New Hampshire is because of a lot of the work that they did. You know, it, it's a compelling story. I think when it's done right, and we could debate what that is, but I think knowing about it and then thinking about it and empathizing with people who take those actions and really shine the light on the thuggishness of the state is something that uh, is a very important part of what we're doing. Because ultimately, the Free State Project, we're trying to attract 20,000 people here, and our job is just simply marketing, making sure more people know about it. So as Ian said, um, we just reached a very, very exciting milestone. We are now 75% of the way there, and <laughs> woohoo! And in fact, we are now at 15,030 movers, which is putting us at a pretty good clip. Um, statistically, si what? Oh, yes, sorry, signers. <laughs> um, that, 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 that's coming next, right? And, and the beautiful thing is that more and more people are moving. They're not waiting. I think with the first 1,000 and with all the work of activists within the state, people are realizing this really is your best chance for liberty in our lifetime. So we have almost 1,500 movers who have moved. Um, you may have noticed that the counter jumped by an extra like 250 over the last month. Although we had an incredible amount of movers, which we typically do during the summer and the fall, but we encourage people to come in the winter too. I moved in February 2008 in the blizzard of February 2008. So the weather should be no excuse. You should just embrace it, face it. We've got four seasons, five if you're counting, mud season. And you know what? States love warm weather. A little bit of cold is something, a little bit of cold to warm the cockles of your freedom heart is good enough. We have about 1,600 friends of the Free State Project. So those are people who have pledged to say, we like what you're doing. That is a number I'd really like to see go up. If people here are looking for projects to work on, especially if you're already in state, I think the friends of the Free State Project number should be 30, 40, 50,000, and they should be predominantly from those people that we were talking about this morning of people who live in this state who are just closet libertarians. They're just people who don't know, don't care. They're not Democrat, they're not Republican, they're independents, they're live and let live people. And I'd love to see that number up. So if someone is interested in volunteering to work on that, come see me or send me a note. So, Yes, I've been president since uh, March, I think, 2011. Um, how I became president is I organized Pork Fest for a couple of years. We have a saying within the community, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> 
So, um, you know, if you do a good job, people will ask you to do more. And, you know, if you're passionate about what you're doing, and I'm certainly very passionate about this, then, you know, it's fun. It's fun when your life and your passions and your job can collide. And so I actually feel really honored and blessed to be able to do this. Um, we have a new website that went up about four or five months ago. It looks pretty shiny, I think. It's definitely a big improvement on the 10-year-old site we used to have. I, for the first time in a long time, feel like we can drive people to the website. It is a true marketing tool again. Ian and I were just talking outside and I suggested that maybe one of the things one can do with things like civil disobedience activism and those stories that inspired many of us to move here is if we aren't attracting the people who want to go do that, it's a high risk activity, it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, is we can start to just sort of uh, reuse a lot of that information of stuff that's already out there and, you know, just put it up there again. A lot of those stories are seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, as we grow our audience, that'll inspire new people. So there are sort of tools that we can use. And so we're going to probably work together, identify some of those top clips. If you, you know, have seen something that really moved you or really inspired you, once again, let me know. We'll put it up and, you know, we'll use it as a tool to get out there. Also on the website, you know, I sometimes hear the criticism, and I think it is partly legitimate, that the organization is not very transparent. The reason for that is because we're a volunteer organization, although you know, I just went full time a, a month ago. And there's no, there's no like evil intent, there's no reason for that other than people are busy, they're doing it on you know, their off time. Um, so one thing that I came up with that I think is gonna work quite well to help with transparency is we're gonna start to make all the projects that we work on available online. So volunteers can go, they can click on community and then look at projects and then look up, you know, what, you know, what are they working on? What do you do? You know, it's like, oh, the people seem to have an impression that they're Liberty Fairy somewhere that make websites work and write press releases and get donors and all of that. And obviously that's not the case. There are people behind the scenes doing a lot of work. And we have a huge volunteer team and I want to be able to put tasks and vision and work all together so that people kind of know we're all pulling the bus together. One of the projects we're working on at the moment is the mover update number. So back to the Liberty Ferries. Uh, because we are actually a pretty strong decentralized organization, and I think Keenvention is actually a testament to that. I love that initiative was taken, there's an event, I've been talking for years, we need a fall event, and I love it even more when someone does something and I don't have to do the work. So really kudos to Ian and the whole team who's put that together. So with the mover numbers, we don't have accurate mover numbers for the people who have moved in the past. People gasp, and they're like, what? And I'm like, well, someone wrote a database 10 years ago, the software probably didn't even exist, or there were privacy concerns, or whatever. So what we're currently doing is anyone who has moved uh, as a participant should have received an email. A lot of those email bounced. If you're a student, please do not sign up with your .edu account, because you will graduate and you will disappear, and we will have a hard time finding you. So um, you should receive an email. We'll also do a Facebook update. We'll um, send out messages. There'll be a blog on the website. But if you've moved, basically, you need to f answer a very short two-question uh, survey and just say, yeah, I think I moved round about these dates or I think my mover number is round about this and then we're going to try and back into it. Why is this important? Because when, and I love that we can say when and we can say it is in the foreseeable future, we trigger the move and we get that influx. I think it'll be really exciting for people to be able to say, hey, I'm this mover number and maybe we can like make t-shirts and people can wear it and if they have their number on, it's a talking piece. And you know, we might not get the original 20,000 to move, but we're gonna constantly start to see more and more people migrate. This is a mass migration movement for more freedom. And we are going to see more people than participants eventually come to this state as we build that beacon of liberty. 
So the trigger, the move. I did some math with our uh, treasurer, and when I calculated that if we stayed at a constant rate of the signer rate we were having at that time, this was about a year ago, we would trigger the move in 2018. And then I worked out how old I was gonna be. <laughs> and I was like, fuck no. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was just like, I don't want to wait that long. My life is here. I'm building a future. Everyone who's moved has come here, is building a future. And why wait? We know this is a great idea. We know it's working. We're seeing tangible results. And, you know, so I was like, all right, let's get this party on the road. So mathematically, our uh, signer rate is currently, and it spikes and it goes up and down depending on what's in the news and, you know, what's going on. We average about six signers a day. It's pretty good, I think. We need to get that up to nine signers. When we have instances like uh, when Robin Hooding was getting a lot of national media attention or with the Bearcat, that'll go up to nine or 10. When we dropped the press release for the 15,000, we saw a little bit of a peak over the weekend. Um, but basically, you know, I have, I don't know, put my reputation on the line and I hate failing. But, you know, we're going to do it by 2015. I've had people say, hey, I think we can do it next year. You know, we have some elections coming up. But it also is, um, it's kind of on all of us. I sort of feel like we're all on this boat together. And, you know, you have a, I don't know if it's a responsibility, but maybe I'll guilt trip you. You know, like all of us should be out there being ambassadors, talking about this, talking up to people what we're doing here. So in order to trigger the move, we also uh, need money. <laughs> it's a part of my speech I always hate, but here we go. So the trigger the move budget is $270,000. What is that? That's to pay me till we trigger the move at 25 bucks an hour. I'm giving you a pretty good rate. I used to, uh, you know, rent myself out for 220. So, you know, I'm definitely taking a haircut and just really taking a base nonprofit salary. Um, the donations will go to that, but then most of the donations will go to uh, triggering the move, thereby you know, more marketing, more um, advertising, and just getting the word out. And I actually also hope to be able to pay many of these fantastic activists who edit videos, for free, who go to jail, you know, who do all these things. I mean, it, you know, we believe in free markets and we should be able to actually reward the people doing the work. Uh, we also, of course, use donations to pay for Chris Lopez. For those of you who don't know, she uh, is a very early, early mover. I think she might have been in the first 100 even. And she just had, you know, a tragic accident happen where she was standing on the deck of her house and the deck collapsed and she fell two stories, she broke her spine, she's paralyzed from the waist down. And um, last year, you know, the community, and that's really what we are, right? We're a community and we believe in private solutions. We believe things like private charity are better than being forced to, to be good. Look, you know, we all wanna be good. You know, if my taxes only went to helping the homeless, I might be a little more inclined to pay them, but of course they don't, right? They go to murder people overseas, they go against you know, victimless, peaceful people in our country. And um, so when Chris's situation happened, a lot of the community started to reach out and we were like, how can we help her help herself? We don't wanna give her a handout, that's not what we're about, but hey, we have all this crappy admin that I hate doing, welcome letters, checking the database, you know, just those day-to-day -day things that need to happen. And so we hired her part-time, it's not a huge amount of money she makes, but she knows that she can take care of herself. And I think that's a really great example of the kind of community we want to build. We've also had some success with uh, larger donors, uh, you know, I go on the road and I go to, uh, lots of times with Mark Warden at the back there, we'll go to some of the bigger festivals, Freedom Fest in Vegas and whatever, and you meet all these mucky mucks and, you know, half the time I don't know who they are, so I'm just myself and then I'll find out afterwards, 
did you know that was that billionaire? And I'm like, no. And I actually had this conversation with someone. I'm talking to this guy. It's 1030 at night. He's a little drunk. I'm a little drunk. He's old. I've got boobs. You know, it's, it's going well. And uh, he's like, what do you do? And I was like, Free State Project. And I'm doing my pitch, and I'm telling him about it, and I'm really excited. And he looks at me, and he goes, oh my god, why have I never heard of this? What do you need? And I'm like, money! <laughs> I need money! And I leave, and someone comes up to me, and they're like, do you know this was so-and-so? And I'm like, who's that? They're like, the billionaire. And I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, I'm going around, I'm starting to build those relationships, and they're starting to pay off. One of the things that's standing a little bit in our way is the 501c3 application. So, what's going on there is the government. And what's worse than the government? The IRS. <laughs> so, you know, we sent in the application more than 18 months ago. We got kicked onto a look closer pile. They've been working on that pile. They're about eight months behind their stated timelines. We might hear something in December. Uh, we've tried several avenues to address that. I did try and join a class action suit for the people who were discriminated against with the whole scandal with Obama and all of that. Apparently, uh, the Free State Project's a little radical because <laughs> they didn't want us in their class, class action suit. But, you know, screw them. Um, <laughs> we also approached um, some of our state uh, mucky muck politician people, and, um, you know, they're looking into it. So we're hoping maybe they can nudge it along a little bit and hoping you know, we, can, we can actually get that. If we do get that, we are very well positioned to get some really decent fundraising and funds and support from uh, larger foundations. So keep your fingers crossed. So one of the donors we, donations we just recently got was uh, from Charles Pax. He's the 3D printer guy. He gave, uh, you know, uh, uh, he said I shouldn't say the number, so he gave some money, uh, which has allowed us to actually get a Free State Project office. It's not super fancy. It is um, a space in an area called, uh, in a building called Area 23, which is um, the second, I would say, activist center opening up in Manchester. So the cool thing is, you know, we have one in Key now, so we've got the the CAC or whatever we're calling it today. <laughs> um, there's of course uh, the, the quill that you guys heard about earlier in that speech and now Area 23. You know what that says to me? Is we're growing. Not only are we growing, but people are taking the steps so that when we do trigger the move, we have systems in place in order to support that number of people. You know, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago and uh, Angela Harris had just, on her own initiative, called together a meeting. About 30 people showed up. It was 7 o'clock on a Friday night. There was something happening afterwards. Good timing. And she just wanted to talk to people about the welcome bags that we do. And I go, we do welcome bags? <laughs> I was like, I never got one. She's like, so it turns out certain regions in New Hampshire, porcupines, make welcome bags. It was fascinating to see how different the bags were. Some of the bags were very practical. They had like hand sanitation and toilet paper and paper towels and that kind of stuff. Another bag had chocolate and red wine and <laughs> all kinds of good stuff, you know? So the idea was, okay, let's create a base bag and then people can customize it according to their regions. So Mark Warden from the Porcupine Realtor, Real Estate, um, he was like, hey, I want to sponsor the bags. And when I put my logo on the one side and we'll put the Free State Project on the other side. And, and I was like, that sounds awesome. And he was talking about some nice looking bags. And I was like, ah, uh, dude, you know you got to times that by 18,500, right? Because those are the numbers we're looking at. So. There was a question earlier about what can I do if I'm a business person or, you know, what are the opportunities? The opportunities are limitless, I believe, here for young people, smart people, old people, 
basically, if you have that inkling where you're like, oh, I could do this, or maybe I could serve a market, the way to look at it is you're on the ground floor. The earlier you move, you're on the ground floor for a groundswell of new customers. So whatever you got, whether it's your Bitcoin laundromat, just start a Bitcoin laundromat near like where the buildings are, where lots of porcupines live. The wealthier people are buying up properties all close enough together so that, you know, we are creating a community. So, you know, I say there are lots of opportunities and the office space is sort of one of those opportunities that gives uh, an area for people to come to. I can have real meetings where I don't have to be like, damn it, now I have to clean my entire house before I can meet, you know? So it, I think it's just really gonna open the doors and I will have an open door policy and once we're in, you know, feel free to come say hi, come hang out, just come check out the space. So, sorry, I talk fast. Some water? No, it's coffee. So uh, on the marketing front, I mentioned earlier we we're going to start um, advertising on the Free State Project website, and I talked a little bit about doing that as in-kind relationship building and that kind of stuff. We're also working on uh, new issue-based brochures. We did an off-site, probably it was early in the year, we, where we identified markets, right? So really, where should we be trying to pull people from? As much as I love going to conferences in California, and actually we have a lot of movers from California, it's a lot harder sell. But we're lucky because we're this little beacon of liberty in this like sea of statism. So you know, pulling people from Rhode Island or Connecticut or upstate New York, mass, I mean, they're low hanging fruit. So really want to start to look at those markets and target those markets. We're working on a new gr gun brochure something that people can take to gun shows. Those people are getting pretty, you know, frustrated, I think, with the way their liberties are being um, infringed upon. So you have, you know, that sort of low-hanging fruit market audience right there. So being able to sort of reach out to those people with, I don't know, brochures that aren't 10 years old and kind of stayed. So um, that is the plan on the marketing front. So when I talk about building relationships, one of the things I'm kind of fascinated by is um, sort of, a, it's a reverse of the amplifier idea, right, with Free Talk Live, you know, you pay X amount and that sort of helps spread the message, is to, um, to use a lot of the voices in the liberty movement to amplify our message. Um, when I was in Freedom Fest in Vegas in July, um, I mean, I loved it because you'd walk around and people can't see you or they have their back to you. And they're all, you know, talking about the Free State Project. People will send me messages and they'll say, oh, I was at this conference. And when people get asked, well, what's the practice? You know, hey, we all know there's a police state. There's a coming authoritarianism. Tyranny is here. What's the solution? We're the solution. And... Um, Doug French, who you know writes for Lou Rockwell and I think some other sites, he's a professor or a, a teacher, some lecturer somewhere. So he showed up at Porkfest, right? He shows up in a, a, a suit and tie. Now, for those of you who haven't been to Porkfest, it's not really a suit and tie kind of event, you know. Liberty Forum a little more so, and I'll talk about that in a second. But so he shows up in his suit and tie. And he's grumpy. Like, I run into him and I'm like, hey, how's it going? And he's like, ma, 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 ma. And I'm like, what's wrong? What can I do? Let me help. And he's like, well, no one told me people were, you know, I couldn't just come and pay with my credit card. And you guys want like Bitcoin and silver. And I was like, and FRNs, you know. And he's just, he's like, yeah, you know, my room smells musty. And I'm like, we do say it's rustic when we invite you. So come on, right? So, you know, we tried to fix some problems, work some things out, gave him some cash flow. I see him maybe like three days later. He's in a Hawaiian shirt. He's just, you know, he's just having the best time. You can just tell he's like mind blown, right? So I run into him 
in Vegas, and he's standing with these back to me. They're having a ciggy at the escalators. And so I, I can hear him, but he can't see me. And he's talking to like a sea of other like, you know, fancy high level libertarian speakers and stuff. And he goes, what? You haven't been to Porkfest? <laughs> And I was like, that's what we want, right? That's what we want, is those people to amplify our message for us. Um, that involves building partnerships and sort of relationships with different people. One of the things I worked on earlier this year is to get Ben Swan involved. For those of you who aren't familiar with his work, it's, he's doing sort of liberty is rising and really trying to push investigative media reporting on like a slick sort of news foxy level of stuff. So we did a joint um, event and that went really well and he's gonna come back for the full span of uh, Liberty Forum. He'll be speaking and then also doing interviews with the other people we get in. Uh, Liberty Forum. All right, so. Liberty Forum will be February 20th to the 23rd, still at the Crown Plaza in Nashua. We did actually try to move it to the Radisson. That didn't quite work out for this year. Um, our biggest challenge, I think, right now with Liberty Forum is it's gotten too big for its space. So we do kind of need to go somewhere, and we'll, we're, I'm working on it, that for 2015. Uh, we have, we'll, we're introducing tours the week before so people can come a little earlier and then go to you know, different parts of the state. They're gonna come to Keene, go up to Grafton, go to the seacoast, and just sort of get that flavor. We're testing it out. I don't anticipate tons of people will come, but you know, even three, four, I've met new people here today and I'm like, that's exciting. New people came out to learn more about this and that's what we want, one person at a time, right? Um, when I started thinking about, okay, what do I want to do with Liberty Forum this year, uh, I decided I wanted to do a really strong whistleblower track, right, and just talk about state surveillance and all of that. Turns out it's a little harder to get a hold of those people than you would imagine. <laughs> but um, we have been, <laughs> we have been, it, it, it's not impossible, but you got to work a lot of angles. So we currently have uh, two whistleblowers, they were uh, both at the surveillance event on the 26th in DC. Thomas Drake, he was the original whistleblower. He was very high up in the NSA and he whistle blew in 2006. And he travels with uh, a lawyer who also whistle blew, who's also originally a government agent, um, Jessica Radnet, Rad, Radic. And uh, she and he have a direct line to Snowden. So we're working that angle. I'm not making any promises. We might, at a minimum, get him to do a message or something. Now, yesterday, when I was corresponding with them and trying to correspond with Julian Assange, uh, my computer crashed. I run Linux. It crashed three times yesterday. <laughs> so I don't know what was <laughs> going on there, but I was like, OK, this is a little fishy. Um, our Friday night keynote, someone I'm very excited about, is Naomi Wolf. She is um, an author. She comes mostly more, I would say, from the progressive side of things. But I heard a, I've been reading her since, you know, my days in South Africa, you know, that little flirtation with feminism that did not last very long. And um, I was very impressed by her two last books. Um, if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. They are written from sort of a left perspective. But she impressed me because she was in a um, podcast with Lou Rockwell. And you could hear, as they were talking, you could hear her ch change her mind. He was talking about education. And of course, she was sort of coming from the perspective of educating people's good. We want people to be able to read and write and, you know. And he was coming from the perspective of education is awesome. People should be reading Latin and Greek. But it shouldn't be a state function. And in fact, when it is a state function, it sucks. And you could hear as they were talking how the penny dropped. You could hear it in her voice. So I'm excited to meet her. I'm excited to see what she has to say. And, um, and I actually think it would be a valuable contribution. We tend to go a, a lot right with the way we approach things. And I, I feel like there's a really big pool of people on the left-hand side. I think, um, you know, 
I know William and Antigone and people who reached out to the Occupy people when that was going down. Initially, I was like, you're crazy. I'm like, we got six free staters out of that. You know, I mean, they may not have signed, but they're aligned and happy and in our community now. So more of that. Pork Fest, of course, is also coming up. That'll be June 22nd to the 29th. Um, I think our goal should be to hit way over 2,000 attendees. Last year, we had over 200 sessions. I think it was a bit much, frankly. So this year, we're gonna try and focus more on practical solutions, lots of like canning classes, and let's build a geodome, and like sort of practical things that people can do during the day, and maybe not quite so heavily intellectual or session-based. So, I am going to open it up to questions and answers. Uh, before I do that, I, no, no, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I'll, okay, I was gonna do my tyranny is rising speech. We were, <laughs> you know, we were talking uh, earlier about activism and uh, civil disobedience and smiles on people's faces and, you know, I personally also love the one where, you know, I love it when you make fun of the government because when people can laugh with you, they're like, um, yeah, that is kind of ridiculous, right? You know, whether you're tilting at the windmill or, you know, in your speedo at the airport. So the, the project I wanted to work on, and I've been talking about this for some years and just honestly don't have the time, but these things are changing, is I was gonna start like a half an hour YouTube show, kind of SNL, you know, and it was gonna be called the Bread and Circuses Domestic Terrorist Show. <laughs> the logic behind that was, I know they're gonna call me a terrorist one day and I wanna preempt them so that when they call me a terrorist, I could be like, ha ha, I already knew that, see my show, and then people could go see it and whatever. The sad part is, the state, which is so slow and so sucky, beat me to it. They called me a terrorist before I could make the show, and I resent that. Um, and I resent being called a terrorist, of course, and I'm sure most of us do. Um, so I guess the point there is don't wait. If you have a great idea, do it, YouTube it, write it, blog it, talk about it. That's how we build audiences. And if you even have you know, that inkling of I want to move here, I want to sign, I want to get involved, don't wait. The time is nigh. The shit is going to hit the fan. And we shouldn't be waiting. We should be in a community of people where we can build something that can stand the test of time and that can be different and new and that truly that beacon where we can say these ideas work. Being peaceful works. Making choices and not forcing people to do things to trade and to make all your decisions on a voluntary basis works. And we got to do it and we need more people. So if you're not here yet, get your butt to New Hampshire. So you'd said that there were uh, six signers a day was the number that we were at. Now, I remember when I was trying to set up Free State Now, um, this is a program that we have sort of in action to, uh, I guess, you know, Carla's working with Free State Now. I've kind of let it go. But when I was trying to set it up initially, I was told that 25 signers a week was a good number. And I got the impression that we were talking maybe three or four people a day tops. Um, what has changed in order to get, besides your presidency, right? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> it's, it's, it's two presidents ago, um, and uh, there, what, there have been like three total, maybe four. Um, what has changed in what's going on? Why, why are we up to six now? What's worked up to this point so that we can find out um, you know, what, what we can continue to do, maybe we can amplify what's worked, or has it just been the fact that the government's getting worse every single day and people are beginning to figure it out? I mean, I think the government is helping. Thank you, government, um, for making our ideas popular. Um, you know, I do think it is that time is nigh thing. I also think it is um, more of us here and that sort of community-based thing where people, one, one of the cool things about being here, right, is you get to sit around in a room every day 
and talk about your ideas and be like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Well, that's not smart, or this is gonna happen, or when we tried this last time, these bad things happened, or these great things happened, right? So the more of us that are here, the more we can do that. On a practical level, I think something as simple as having a pretty website that is easy to sign up on, is not hurting, I mean, I think it is, and I think social media as a tool, you know, the internet, uh, technology is just making it easier to get the message out there, and we have more of those amplifiers, we have more movers who are really interested in media, we have FTL, you know, LRN, we have all these tools, so I think it's just a snowball effect, really, you know, I mean, if I look at the growth, when I did uh, Porkfest in 2009, we had just over 600 attendees. So in five years, six years, like we've tripled, I don't know, that's math, but a lot more people <laughs> coming, you know, and everyone, I've never heard anyone go, I had a bad time and, you know, I'm not gonna tell people about this, you know? You find your tribe within the tribe. Some people wanna go strum at the bonfires. Some people wanna go shooting at the range, you know? You find your peeps there. And I think, you know, those kinds of events, more people, more amplifying, is, is what, what is making us grow. And honestly, it's probably also because of technology that we can track it. I bet you when you ask that question, someone just gave you some bullshit answer. Someone was just like, I think it's, did you calculate it? I did not calculate it. That was the president of the Free State Project at well, the time. I, well, the thing is, I, 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 um, I'm fairly confident the tools weren't really there. I mean, when I, you know, when I look now and I'm like, oh, I can actually answer these questions now. Someone asks me, I can be like, I'm sure because there's a machine that tells me the answer, you know, and it's and I'm not disparaging. I don't mean bullshit in like a negative way. It's like if you're volunteers and you're like, I don't know. I mean, it goes up. I, uh, you know, let me divide the last number by seven or by 31 or, you know, um, but I just think, you know, we're, we're becoming a little more professional and that's not a bad thing. It's, you know, that's how we grow and how we get better. Hello, Carla. Hello. I have a kind of difficult question for you, right. so apologies beforehand. Uh, on the FAQ page of the Free State Project website, there's the statement about people that support racism, bigotry, and violence are not welcome. Why is that statement not on the sign-up form? Um, I think it wouldn't hurt to have it there. I have also tried to slightly change the wording of the statement of intent, and it's almost just not worth the effort. I do think that statement should, it gets complicated. So now you change, right? You've, you've signed a pledge. So anyone who's already signed the SOI has signed a pledge. If you change the pledge, then you have to, I think, in any event, and maybe this is the lawyer in me, you kind of have to go back to the other people and be like, do you now agree with this new statement because you signed and you're being counted as a participant and all of that? So I honestly just don't think it's worth the effort. I do think it's worth putting right near where you signed. So right, that for clarification, can see it right there. my question wasn't about changing the statement of intent, okay. just putting that statement about the people that are not welcome on the actual sign-up form yeah. itself. That way people know up front, oh, wait a second, I'm a skinhead, I probably don't fit in. Right. And you don't. And for clarification, I'm not a skinhead. <laughs> Hi. The motto is liberty in our lifetime, and you mentioned a number of examples uh, in your speech about uh, ways that liberty has been achieved on a personal level for a lot of people. Um, I'm curious, what are some ways that your liberty has, has been enhanced since you've been able to come to New Hampshire? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I'm a lot more open with my pot smoking. <laughs> Actually, when, when uh, we were talking about, they were talking about the uh, 420 rallies, I was thinking, oh, you know, when you're, when you're just naive and have no idea, I think it was probably two weeks after I'd moved, um, I came to Keene, and um, it was the first time I'd ever open carried. Um, I probably shouldn't have been, given how much I really knew. I mean, I'd gone shooting a few times, but it was definitely sort of a homemade holster situation, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna carry my gun, and I was like, and yeah, I'm gonna smoke some weed with the kids out on the, you know, the uh, gazebo, 
And I was literally from here to Mark, away from a cop, with my gun and my spliff. <laughs> and I was like, because that's kind of just, you know, with my impression of how it was at that stage. Now looking back, I'm like, whoa, that was pretty ballsy. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, I think when you exercise your Second Amendment rights, it, you know, maybe keeps everyone in line a little more. Um, for me, the biggest, the biggest plus for me is the community. That's why I talk about it a lot. Um, I think just having that freedom of being able to be yourself. You know, we started this morning with the, the ladies panel and I talked about, you know, just your voice and your, who you are. I mean, I personally believe, you know, freedom comes from within and you have to sort of embrace and decide, this is who I am and it's okay. We don't all have to be, you know, little boxes, little boxes on the hillside. Like we all get to be who we are. And so, just growing, growing into myself, and also learning that um, you don't always have the answers. You know, I ha heard someone say, you know, people who argue that uh, certain activism or certain things poison the well. I personally do not hear a lot of that anymore. I think by just sort of changing the narrative to uh, different people use different tactics, and you don't have to agree with their tactics. But you know, don't really rain on their parade because they're doing what they are passionate about and being able to say, hey, maybe we have these kind of three tracks, right? We have people who are working through politics and who have been really effective here. You know, I always make the joke, and I, I said this to Stefan Molyneux, and I could see him kind of go, huh. You know, he, he was making an argument that voting is immoral and blah de blah. And I was like, but what if anarchists are voting in anarchists, right? And not everyone who runs is an anarchist. You know, of course, some people want to use the system. But for the most part, we're scaling back the state by using that tactic. Civil disobedience, I think, is an effective tactic. It's an effective tactic from a marketing perspective and, you know, to really show people what the state is. And then, you know, we have the, the free market agora tactic, and those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. In fact, the question has been asked here several times today, what makes it the most effective? And I think it's when you cross all of those things, right? So, when I got arrested for filming the Ware Police, they, um, they, that wasn't even technically civil disobedience, right? Because it's legal to do. They just pretended like it wasn't legal. We're now in the appeals court. You know, I was down in Boston a month ago. So we're at the stage where it's like they have to make a decision. And the decision is pretty much, I'll do this in a nutshell, um, the Glick decision from the Boston Commons said, well, yes, you are allowed to film you know, during the day on the Boston Commons, because that's sort of a very, you know, public place and it has a history of uh, speech and freedom of speech and all of that. But the question in my case was, well, I mean, the bottom line is, and this is what I said to the judge, is I'm like, so you're making an argument that the Constitution stops working after dark? Because that's pretty much what they're arguing, right? They're saying it doesn't work after dark and it doesn't work in a highly uh, dangerous situation like a traffic stop on a highway. The highway is Route 10 from here to, to Weir, right? It's, it's a two-lane road. It's not a highway. There was no danger. I was very far away. So, okay, so, so that was CivDIS, let's say. Then we tried legislatively to you know, take the wiretapping off. That kind of worked. It's probably still on the table, but we're trying to go through those tax, uh, tracks, um, sued them, so we're using the state against the state. I got a phone call on Monday to the 1-800 number, so I didn't answer it. We're PD just got a new police chief, right? So we've basically gotten rid of three cops out of that station. They have a new PD. He called me to be like, hey, I just wanted to call and say hi. And I was like, well, I can't talk to you. I'll have my lawyer talk to you. So I had my lawyers call him. And he was like, look, I know there's a problem in my department. I just want to make sure we have a you know, good working relationship. I'm pretty sure they lied about what happened that night. And I was like, that's us winning. And that's across the board of all of those things, right? So I think perseverance and kind of sticking it out and starting in one place and then kind of trying all those tactics is probably the way we're gonna win. 
So the Free State Project's been very successful, um, and some competitions sprung up. Like Glenn Beck's trying to steal your idea, for God's sake, Carla. Um, there's, uh, you know, Glenn Beck's, I don't know what his thing is, but uh, exactly. But um, th there's the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. There's... Austin, whatever they're doing in Austin. There's uh, some of uh, the Citadel, I think, is in Idaho. And if you go to move, the Move Here Project, if you search that on Facebook, you'll find I've chronicled about a half a dozen different, uh, different things. It seems like everybody wants to move to Central America, actually. Um, but the, so how do you, in a world where you know, the Free State Project started, there was no competition. Clearly, you've been successful enough to create People say, wow, that's just a fantastic idea. I'll get 1,000 or 1,500 people to move where I want. Good and, luck. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> It'll only take you a decade. Um, and, and so they want to create the same thing. What do you, you know, how do you address that? What do you do with that? What's, what's that bring up in your, in your heart? And when you think oh, what does that bring world? up in my heart? <laughs> um, I mean, competition is good. It's something I believe in. So I'm like, you know, have at it. I'm not going to help promote them, so we should definitely edit out that question but, <laughs> or the list. But I think that, um, I think two things. One is, I think the Free State Project and what we're doing is, is uh, unique in a way that those others aren't. And there are nuances, you know, some people, you know, they, they really want to get out of the country or, you know, some people want, uh, Blue Ridge is more voluntarist. Um, we have the biggest community. We've also had the most success. There's a reason New Hampshire got chosen, and that's why I said we need to up those numbers of friends of the free state, because we have a lot more support in the state that is untapped. So, you know, if people say, oh, we have 1,500 signers, if we can say, well, we've got 50,000 friends of the free state, we're like, okay, well, you know, that's, I don't know, the population of something. And, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So, um, so the Free State Project in and of itself, I think, is the most workable idea because of, to some extent, the caliber of people we're attracting. Um, and also, I think, the, the sort of passion and, and, and um, the, the real passion that people are bringing to it. On the other hand, I also believe that this is a, a worldwide revolution in ideas. And I like to think within our lifetime, not only are we going to have liberty in our lifetime in New Hampshire, but that you know, those other places will help to spread those ideas. So you, you, know, so you got you to gotta be like, hey, I want the philosophy out there. But then I want to be like, not only do I want the philosophy out there, I want the people to understand this is the best option. I have a related question. Uh, I should preface it with uh, an example. Uh, are you familiar with an author that goes by the pseudonym Boston, middle initial T, last name Party? Yes, yeah. I know him personally. Yeah. So for people who aren't familiar, uh, he has a lot of good books. Uh, he's got some gun books, um, uh, Boston's Gun Bible. He's got You and the Police. It's about 20 years old, so it's a little outdated. Um, he has a novel, Molan Lob, that was uh, written shortly after the vote. And uh, basically, in the novel, uh, there's a divergence between the real timeline and his fictional timeline is roughly when he wrote the book. But uh, when the vote came in, in the book, in the real timeline, he complains and he kind of badmouths the decision to use New Hampshire because uh, you know, it's physically small and, uh, you know, it's... He also started Free State Wyoming, Free State and, Wyoming and how and many and people have heard of that. <laughs> right. Sorry. And so, uh, Sorry. When the move is triggered or maybe after that when we actually get 20,000 plus transplants, do you foresee diehard people like him coming around and uh, admitting maybe that they, uh, that this was a good choice and maybe him bringing the few people he has and other people doing the same and then maybe getting even more people and having sort of an avalanche effect? Well, I mean, so Boston Tea Party has come out to uh, Liberty Forum twice. He's spoken there. He's a really nice guy. He's a smart guy. He, didn't want to leave, you know, there's a big difference between a place like Wyoming and New Hampshire, yes, you know. So I see him as one of those people where it's complimentary. There are, you know, I don't know, maybe someone's passionate about like being a cowboy and living on a dude ranch and, you know, having that lifestyle. And so if the lifestyle 
that New Hampshire offers, and I think it offers a really awesome lifestyle, lots of seasons, lots of people, it has mountains and sea and great food and lobster. And you know, it's so, it's not, obviously New Hampshire is not gonna appeal to everyone, so I see them as one of those complimentary things where it's like, hey, maybe you know, write a book about New Hampshire, just fictionally set it here, or you know, he's, he, he, I doubt he would move out. Um, I, I don't really see it as a competition. Last I heard, they had 100 movers. Um, you know, Austin has uh, Antonio Bueller, <laughs> I like to tell, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know, a little healthy rivalry is not too bad, and I tease John Bush a lot, and I'm like, yeah, you have one mover. <laughs> um, you know, so it's, it's ultimately, you know, I, I, before I decided to move to New Hampshire, I was gonna leave the country too, as other people here have said, you know, researched options. And so I think, you know, for a lot of people, I think the way for us to start to think about what we're doing is that we're actually building a safe haven for well-informed people. If you know there's trouble and you're looking for a safe haven, this is the place to come because people are well-informed, people kind of understand the issues in a way that others might not, and then we have lucked out in the sense that there is a very strong libertarian presence within the state itself, and we just need to awaken that beast within you know, the hearts and minds of people here. Did that answer the, your question? Right, I have really? a sort of a related question. I've seen uh, estimates that if you take the U.S. population, it's roughly 40 percent that could be described as some sort of some variation of liberal, 40%, some variation of conservative, whether it's neoconservative or paleoconservative or what have you. And the other 20% would be some variation of libertarian, whether anarcho-capitalist or minarchist or whatever. So 20% of 300 million people is 60 million people. Once we get the 20,000 as our proof of concept, do you foresee exponential growth after that? And like swamping the state where you know, all the, the statist liberals and so forth are just we can only totally, wish. totally drowned out. <laughs> You know, it's like, hey, move to Rhode Island, go to Connecticut, you know, I mean, we can only hope, but I also think one should be sensitive to the fact um, that, you know, people do view it as, oh, you're coming here and you're taking us over and whatever, and I imagine, you know, every one of us that has like a little fire in our heart might, you know, if it was your state and you didn't agree with the people moving in, it would probably irk you, you know, so I think, you know, changing that dialogue, like I said earlier, I believe in my lifetime these ideas will spread. I, it's because of the internet and we need to get our mesh nets up and our you know, second channels to do all of those things. But, um, you know, and Amanda's gonna be working on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I mean, ultimately I do think that you know, some places will stay the way they are and get worse and worse and some places will get better and I believe New Hampshire is, is that place. Any other questions? So uh, you can find us at freestateproject.org. You can find us on Facebook. If you're thinking about moving, uh, join the FSP Job Alert on Facebook. That's a great place to see jobs that are posted. There are also regional groups and meetups. Come to Liberty Forum, tell your friends, and uh, let's get this revolution on the road. All right, so great. I love Carla's passion. She is so passionate, and I think she's such the right person for the job of president of the Free State Project. Obviously, if you haven't had a chance to meet her in person, please take the time to do that. Uh, so, still to come here tonight, uh, we got a raffle drawing happening now. Two drawings going to be happening, and Daryl will tell you more about the raffle if you haven't heard about that yet. Um, also, if you are a VIP attendee of the Keenvention, the KAC, the Keen Activist Center, has a semi-open house tonight, and you are invited. So if your name is on the, uh, the sheet in the back, the sign-up sheet, if you don't yet have, uh, you'll need to do that if you haven't yet done so. But there's also uh, a map back there as well. If you haven't gotten one of the little yellow maps, that'll help you get to the KAC here. That starts basically now, so as soon as you leave here. 
Um, in addition to that, coming up at 7 o'clock tonight, if you're interested in going cop blocking, Eric Freerock is in the audience here. That's him right there with a the hat on. Uh, he will be uh, taking you out and about. Uh, it's actually, you really can't beat this weather for cop blocking in the fall. It's usually brittle cold out, and so tonight's going to be a real good night to be on the streets. So if you want to join in on uh, some cop blocking here in Keene, Eric will be showing you the ropes. Meet back here at the hotel in the lobby at 7 o'clock and then you guys will uh, will hit the road from there. Uh, let's see, other news. If you're out and about around town, you've got a car, tune into 102.3. It's our local uh, community uh, uh, unlicensed radio station. You'll hear Free Talk Live starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, the Angel Clark Show is on as we speak. So enjoy that this evening. Also, uh, one other thing. There was interesting news about the Robin Hooding today, um, and I don't know if... Uh, James Cleveland is back there, but th yeah, there he is. He's going to be speaking on the direct action panel tomorrow, so I imagine James will be telling you more about what happened today. We wanted you to be able to go Robin Hooding uh, today in Keene, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the city of Keene knew that we're here. In fact, they uh, back when they filed the lawsuit against us back in May, they cited my post on the Keenevention site saying, we think there might be 300 free staters in town for Keenevention. Uh, and, you know, as a reason. So they, they really thought there were going to be hundreds of you out in the streets. Probably would have been more like, you know, a dozen or something like that. But they didn't know that. So um, basically, they didn't have anybody doing parking enforcing today. So because you guys are here, they canceled parking enforcement all day today. And you know what? That's a total endorsement of this whole idea of the Free State Project. It's yet another example that numbers matter. Having concentration of activists in the same geographic area is the most critical aspect and uh, you know if you can make them go away simply by your presence what a what a total win so thanks everybody for coming out to the first day of Keenvention I'm so grateful that you came I didn't know what to expect I thought we might have three people here this morning for the first panel and we had 22 there's almost 40 people in the room now uh, actually more than 40 so I'm really pleased we've only got uh, we've got about a uh, 90 people who are registered so almost half of uh, the attendees came out for the first day. So thanks. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy each other's company. We'll see you back here at 9 in the morning. Stick around for the raffle uh, with Daryl here. And also at 9, we will be kicking off with the LGBT panel. Uh, you will not want to miss that, uh, that one. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.